So this is Seahorse. She's a Hansa 291. The 291 was the first boat ever made by what is now the Hansa Group. You see, back in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. Michael Schmidt, the founder of the company, who was already building racing boats, decided this was too good an opportunity not to take advantage of. So he went and found himself an old rundown boatyard in the Eastern Bloc that he could use to make the sort of boat that he felt the market needed. As part of this process, he wanted to get in quick, so he found himself a boat that was already a proven design, the Aphrodite 29 or 291. A sweet little sailing boat that as a racing man, Michael could appreciate. So basically what he did was remake these boats cheaply. And I don't say cheaply to do them any disservice, because they're still solid little boats, but I mean cheap. He sold them at less than two thirds of what was then the going rate for an equivalent boat. So he made quite a splash on the market. Anyway, this is a Hansa 291. Let's take a look at our one, Seahorse. We'll start at the front perhaps and we'll point out some of the things that make her the boat she is. So on board then, and starting at the front. A small but functional bow roller that we, uh, we tie our mooring lines onto so there's no chance they can bounce off. A pulpit like normal, navigation light on the front. There's two good sized deck cleats, one on each side. I know no fair lead for them, but um, it doesn't give us a problem. It's got this nice um, rounded, smooth aluminium tow rail, which gives good, good grip on your sailing. It stops any chafe on the ropes if the mooring lines are just rubbing against them. And um, there's lots of sort of clip on, tie on points if you want to tie anything on deck, which is good. Because we've been racing recently, spinnaker pole, it's kind of clipped into its normal racing when not in use position but that means it goes across the hatch that goes to the v-berth um, when we're cruising we tend to move it to one side so uh, it doesn't get in our way now as standard these boats would have come with a self-tacking jib here a track um, as i've mentioned already seahorse well, most Hansa 291s are all unique, and Seals is no exception. And because she was set up for racing, we use a hanked on jib, so we've got more control over our foresails and a range of different foresails. So the track's gone. I might just pause at this point and point out that we really don't have a problem with hanked on jibs, not only from a racing point of view, but from a cruising point of view as well. We have a number three cruising jib that we use that just stays permanently on deck. And although it's slightly less convenient to have to drop it and stow it in its bag while we're cruising as it is to just pull a rope and furl it up, but it really isn't a hardship and at least we know it will always come down. The one thing with furlers is you're always compromised if you try to shorten sail and you can bet your life they'll jam just at the point at which it's most inconvenient. So in place of that, and I don't know how much of these are standard, we have two um, fairly jib tracks on the deck. The smaller one in balls we use for our number three. The bigger one, which is adjustable from the cockpit, um, we use for our number one. Typical bottle screws to adjust the rigging, which I do tend to fiddle with a little bit because it's actually obviously it's a simple rig. All the control lines are led back to the cockpit. It's all ball race blocks. Um, through the fair lead or the deck, the deck organizer and then back to the clutches at the cockpit. The only things you have to come forward for on this boat when you're sailing it really is to put the pole on and off and when you're reefing to clip the um, tack cringle, reefing cringle onto the uh, cow's horn bit. I've done a film on reefing if you want to know what I mean, mean <laughs> and my bad use of terms, have a look at that. So continuing aft, we have um, normal kind of kicker set up, led back to both sides though on the cockpit roof so you can reach it whatever tack you're on, and then a seldom boom strut, which um, is irritatingly badly designed so the water runs down inside it and rots it so, and it seizes up and you can't get it apart but um, it does a, it does a job for us so we don't use a topping lift there's pretty good handholds all the way 
nice three handle thing on the deck roof by the time you've got got past that you can reach the shrouds and then the mast so you've got plenty to hang on to and as we move aft once you've passed that point you can reach the clutches and winches and so forth to hang on to so the cockpit then for a 29 foot boat it's a pretty good size because it's racing we have this uh, silly traveler going across the middle but if you didn't have that it would be a good size cockpit but we do race it so we like our traveler it works really well we have a course and fine adjustment on the main cell and you can reach the traveler easily from each side and i can do all that single-handed from just sitting out on the uh, side of the combings which are actually surprisingly comfortable they've got that nice kind of negative angle on them so that as it's healed over you're uh, you're sort of still in the boat and i of course if i can put my finger to it have these nice foot bars that i can put brace myself on so that i'm properly locked into the boat when we're sailing it's tiller steered i know a lot of people prefer a wheel i much prefer a tiller um, you get better feel from it and for in this case if i just untie it right in our case because we have a nice funky auto helm we can lift the tiller up out of the way freeze up loads of space in the cockpit but the boat will still steer itself quite happily the other end of the cockpit or the forward end of the cockpit is the instruments it's all bng on our on that seahorse these multi-function displays colored um, you can get all your information on whichever display you want so we have one of them on each side they're the controls to the auto helm because the auto helm is permanently attached and then there's a nine inch bng zeus chart plotter underneath that one thankfully there's also plenty of storage there's a not especially useful but still good for something that's right at the back ours is not useful because we have this um, large arm on it for control for the auto helm so it seriously restricts our access to it but it's um, it's a proper full depth Lazarette locker you can get loads of things in there if you want we use it for you know muddy wheelings and boots and dinghies and things that you don't need day to day on the port side though it's what you might call the main locker again it's another full depth down to the bilge locker we have all our fenders in it mooring lines bucket boat hooks all that type of stuff um, but it's also got the water tank and the hot water cold water or fresh water tank and the hot water tank in there the diesel tank is actually underneath the cockpit floor So that's kind of everything um, outside. Let's go down below and I'll show you down below. Before we do go down though, one thing I will show you, washboards, always a pain aren't they, where to put them? On the Hansa 291, they fit, or they do before someone like me who didn't really know the reason for it, made these bits of wood too big, they fit on top of the sliding coach roof, companionway top or whatever, so that you can just put it there, slide the coach roof back, and uh, it's out of the way. What a great idea, why don't, why don't most boats do that? Doesn't fit on our one unfortunately because I didn't realise that when I restored this and replaced this piece of Perspex and um, because this piece of Perspex had a crack in it I deliberately made the fiddles or the bits of wood that are screwed on top of it oversized because I didn't want it cracking again. Um, so consequently it doesn't fit anymore but had I known about it I could have still made them oversized and I could have still made that fit but um, Although it's a great idea, I'm not going to take it all off and fit it again, but there are a lot of good little ideas on these boats. So coming down below, we have a good sized saloon with two uh, benches stroke, cushion stroke, sleeping um, berths on each side and then a central cockpit table with one fold out leaf that you can kind of comfortably get four around. These settee saloon type benches back bit folds up, hooks up out of the way to give you a bigger sleeping area. And as you can see, we keep our bedding tucked in behind there. And they make a nice comfortable berth.
saloon table just folds up like that. Note the hook. Long time viewers of our channel will remember the hook. There's, there's a drawer there we use for cutlery. No central wine lockery bit or whatever, but um, it's a good saloon. There's just about headroom. Well, there's no, there's not headroom. If you're above five, seven, five, eight, your head just touches the ceiling. Um, so um, it's not a boat for big people. But it's a good size. There's plenty of storage. There's storage underneath both bunks, um, one on each side. The storage up here, although on our boat, this one has lost a lot of it. There's a new uh, fuse panel in there for all the modern electronics. There's more on that side. There's more shelving over here. There's shelving all along the top, which is good for cluttering, uh, keeping your clutter like you do. Same on this side. We use this side more for food. So there's food in those two overhead lockers. There's cooking utensils under here, things like that. And then there's boat hooks and flags and other stuff that you have. So if I keep turning around, the galley, which you have to say is kind of small, but you know, you can work with it. There's a gimbaled two burner oven stove top, which is fine. Behind it in the corner is a cool box that's set into the worktop, um, which gives you access to the seacock underneath. Silly design, but it works. Sink, hot and cold running water. Under the steps, there's access to the engine. I'll come back to that. Then we have a good sized quarter berth, which the um, literature optimistically calls a double, but I would call a generous single. Two kids could sleep in it, but, uh, but it's a good length. Goes all the way back down there. And then underneath, there's more storage. This is where the original switch panel fuse box would be. Ours is kind of taken over now by the AIS equipment and the radio and so forth. But um, it's a good position. And main isolators underneath this lift up panel here. Nice easy access. So the engine, move the steps, is underneath there. It's reasonable access. You can gain access to it from the back as well. The panel comes up, so you get a reasonable width, but it is a bit of a squeeze in there. It's a two cylinder, 10 horsepower Volvo, which with a sail drive leg, which is perfect for this boat. Um, it's enough, enough grunt to push it along at kind of six knots. Um, yeah, and it's not too big, it's good. Okay, so going forward, the bit we haven't seen, in an old school way, unlike modern boats, the head is at the head of the boat, so to speak. See, there's the bit that separates the saloon from the V-berth. Perfectly functional, and as much as Hannah says there isn't a door, if you open up this cupboard here, you can close it off so that guests, broadly speaking, can't see what you're up to. But it's not really a boat for entertaining people on, it's a boat for a family. The V-Berth's a reasonable size. It's, um, it's not enormous, but Hannah and I can sleep comfortably in there. Or as we have been recently, Elizabeth sleeps in there with a big pile of toys and everything else. So turn it into her little room. We've made a small screen here that will drop down just to give you a little bit of privacy. Oh, well, I should have mentioned the head. Again, there's hot and cold water sink. The sink will pull out as well, slides out to get better access if you need to. So that's about it. As I've already mentioned, pretty much every Hansa 291 is gonna be different. So um, that's just how we have Seahorse rigged. But they are great little boats. And although there's not many 291s around, the 300s, 301s, 302s, or whatever, I don't know how many numbers they went up to, which are all basically the same boat, but with a slightly longer hull and then a more modern and fitted out interior. Um, they'd make a great boat for you as well. And they're a little bit more, um, you, you know what you're gonna get. Yeah, Hansi 291s are some beautiful, if you look around, there are some beautifully finished out boats uh, out there, but equally, there are plenty that um, never really got beyond the cheap home build sort of look. So. Um, uh, you need to kind of keep your eyes open for one. But 
Do you know the biggest strength is the thing I can't actually show you in this film. It's how well they sail. They sail beautifully. They've got no ill manners at all. The helm's got enough feedback to give you some um, some response, but not so much you're fighting it the whole time. It responds beautifully to sail trim and sail setup. Um, they're lovely. They're really nice boats to sail. So um, anyway, I hope you found this film useful. I'm Ian. This is Sailing with the Foxwell family. Um, if you did like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know um, what you think of it in the comments. See you next week.